everyone, my name is Carlin Lacasse and today we're going to be talking about a pretty raw topic that is often avoided but desperately needed, and that is spiritual abuse in the church, specifically from leaders within the body of Christ. The thing is, both men and women are constantly reaching out to us at Mountain Movers who are struggling and suffering at the hands of spiritual abuse. They've been left wounded, mentally tormented, and even some have turned away from the Lord. This abuse leaves people struggling with their faith, and it distorts their view of God, and their, it distorts their view of God's love. Sadly, many people have been crippled by negative experiences in the church at the hands of spiritual abuse. But tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to take action and we're going to expose this enemy. I'm going to teach you how to quickly identify a Jezebel network or spiritual abuse in the church so you can avoid unnecessary drama, unnecessary witchcraft, and unnecessary soul wounds. And if you find yourself in this situation and you're seeking some direction or confirmation, we're going to cover that too. So after you listen to this tonight and you find that you might be in a situation like that, you're going to have some clear direction and confirmation on what your next step should be, okay? You know, it's very confusing when you're in a situation where there is people who have clearly been used by God to help you at times and even helped you in tremendous ways, but then they turn around and get used by the enemy to bring great harm and soul wounds into your life. Maybe they go back and forth from helping you so much to causing harm back and forth and back and forth. That is the pattern of an abusive relationship, right? Once some, sometimes it's really good, sometimes it's terrible, then it goes back to good and they forget the terrible and everyone else can clearly see that it's not right, but the person in the situation is very confused. So it's important to understand that God did not create you or call you into a life of bondage and servitude to an organization. We've been delivered from that. That's religion. You see, the thing is, in many church or ministry environments, there's an unseen force at work, and that is a spiritual influence which undermines God's true order and stifles the healing, freedom, and deliverance that is available to us through following Christ. This influence is commonly called a Jezebel spirit, which that reference comes from Queen Jezebel in the Old Testament, of course, who was known for her manipulation, her control, her witchcraft and intimidation and just rebellion against God in general. But it's really important to understand that Jezebel, when people are talking about that, it doesn't really refer to a ghost of a deceased queen from thousands of years ago. It's not this ghost or spirit, evil spirit roaming the earth, looking for a body to inhabit. What Jezebel, the term is actually describing is a complex network of spirits, which includes perversion, control, manipulation, religious deception, monitoring spirits, and spiritual witchcraft, which together produce a character that aligns very closely with the behavior found of Queen Jezebel in God's word. So that's the reason I'm telling you that is if you're in a situation like this, or you have been, you probably found that casting out Jezebel by itself isn't going to do much for that situation. Because someone who carries this network is going to have to choose with their own free will to not only repent, but stop the manipulating behavior in order to go free. And most of the individuals that are under this are not going to do that. Same goes for most of the churches or organizations that are involved under it. And we're going to talk about why. So when we talk about a Jezebel infected church, what we're really talking about is a church that is spiritually abusive and operates under false religion, control, manipulation, seduction, and witchcraft. Right? The word talks about seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, having their own conscience seared. So this abuse can come, this abuse can come in many forms, many different denominations, from many cultural backgrounds, but it always shares certain attributes, which is what we're going to be focusing on this evening, which is going to help you better recognize it, okay? The network of spirits called Jezebel what it's doing is that it seeks to infiltrate anointed churches or ministries, especially those that are involved in spiritual warfare and deliverance. It operates through illegitimate power and authority outside of God's word, 
which is actually the essence of witchcraft. So 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober and be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. That's a warning to remind us to stay alert because the enemy is using spirits to infiltrate and devour us. And it will infiltrate and devour your life in your church or your ministry if it's left unchecked. So today I'm going to help you learn to easily recognize this network and learn how to avoid the destruction that comes from being entangled with it. I'm going to share 10 warning signs or patterns that show a church or ministry is probably infected with this network, which we call Jezebel. And I know we often hear about scandalous affairs in large ministries, which is always devastating and it brings shame to the body of Christ. It brings shame to the name of the Lord. However, it's really important to understand that there are so many other various ways that a ministry can be destroyed and experience Jezebel's destruction aside from blatant sexual scandals. So keep that in mind because what happens is the enemy uses these big situations like that to normalize and nullify anything that doesn't get to that level. But just because something is not at that level doesn't mean it's not still abusive or not okay with God. Okay. And in Revelations 2.18, it says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, and faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So good job, right? No. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my spirits to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give each one of you according to your works." So nobody likes to read that. It's very uncomfortable to think about, and a lot of people avoid that. But I assure you that it was not mistakenly put in God's word, and there's a very important reason that this is one of the warnings that was given to the church, because God knew the amount of this shenanigans was going to exist in the church. So he's saying right here that that's not okay, and he's not okay with it. And it is a thing that exists, okay? I know it's very confusing, and a lot of times when you're in that situation, it seems like it's okay, but here's God telling you that it's not okay. It's not okay with him. So Jesus harshly rebukes the church in Thyatira for tolerating Jezebel, right? So even though that church produced good works, the key word was that they tolerated Jezebel, which means they were aware of the issue, but they chose not to address it properly. Therefore, all of the good works were nullified in the eyes of the Lord. And the thing is, awareness of abuse without taking action, that's still a form of abuse, even if you're not directly involved with it. If you know something is wrong and you tolerate it, you're contributing to the problem and therefore you're sharing in the responsibility of the harm. And if we don't understand healthy boundaries, which is a pretty prevalent situation, we have teachings about the boundaries of the Lord and how to have healthy boundaries on our YouTube page. You should check them out because if you don't understand healthy boundaries, you're always going to find yourself in situations where your boundaries are being trampled. We have to make the effort to learn how to have healthy boundaries and learn how to stop with habits that produce unhealthy boundaries, or we're going to continually find ourselves in situations where our boundaries are being trampled or things are happening that are not okay with God. And one of the key areas that you want to evaluate in any church or ministry, or even in your own personal relationships is how personal boundaries are ha handled. Do they respect God given boundaries or do they overstep them? Because what I'm about to share about spiritual abuse and that spirit of Jezebel or the Jezebel network is every single attribute I'm about to share violates the boundaries that God has set for us. Free will is a critical boundary in the eyes of the Lord and he never crosses it. 
leaderships and ministries that are spiritually abusive always cross that boundary and plenty of other boundaries. So leaders of churches and ministries are held to a higher standard in how they treat people. You'll always find demonic, abusive, Jezebelic, perverted type behaviors in worldly corporate America. And that's to be expected because that's of the world. But leaders of a church or a ministry, when they assume a title of pastor or minister or whatever other title they're calling themselves, they're committing to represent the Lord in their conduct, especially in the way that they treat people. So the way that you treat people is very important in the eyes of the Lord. And while some people take that lightly, I can assure you that God does not, especially not when you're doing it in his name. So it's important to understand that while no one likes a Jezebel and their behaviors can be absolutely dreadful when you're dealing with it, they're not actually the root problem. They're merely a symptom of a deeper issue of dysfunction. The real issue lies within the person tolerating the behavior to include us when we're tolerating it. So keep that in mind. The issue of spiritually abusive organizations is within that organization's leadership because Jezebel cannot operate alone. It relies on others to feed off their emotional energy. So unless the leaders are the ones tolerating it, repent and seek healing and deliverance from whatever's causing them to compromise, the cycle is going to continue. We also have to take into consideration that if we're tolerating this, we need to ask ourselves why. Because normally the answer is fear, insecurity, and intimidation. So I have an assignment for you. If you don't get anything else out of this teaching, grab hold of this, okay? You ready? Stop being okay with things that are not okay. Amen? Especially in ministry. So let's get to these warning signs. Warning sign number one, chaos and confusion. The easiest way to spot this is there's going to be significant chaos and confusion. People in ministries that come under Jezebel carry strong confusion, which creates anxiety. This is an attribute of witchcraft. That network of spirits carries this witchcraft. That's how it's able to stay. It works with a scattering spirit. It scatters the sheep. It scatters the truth. It even scatters the pastor or the leader's brain. Have you ever heard of the term scatterbrained? Where people are forgetful. They can't remember this. They can't remember that. They can't remember yesterday. They make lots of mistakes. This thing will take a highly intelligent individual, a highly anointed person, and turn them into a forgetful, confused Joe Biden type. I've seen mighty men and women of God totally lose their identity from messing around fellowshipping and tolerating with Jezebel personalities in their organization. What happens is they invite them into their homes. They share all the ministry's business. They share details about people they've counseled with that are personal matters. They even share their own marital issues with this individual. They've earned their trust and become their number one competent. And what happens is as you're fellowshipping with someone under this witchcraft, it welcomes oodles and oodles of chaos and witchcraft into your own life and into your organization. It's not good. So my best advice to you is that if you suspect someone is operating under this network, don't tell them any of your personal business whatsoever. Keep it strictly business. And if that per if you're in leadership, and the person you're dealing with is not repentant and looking to get free from that behavior, do not keep them thinking that you're going to help them because they don't want help. They have a different agenda than you do. I've seen this happen over and over again over the course of 15 years. Countless scenarios which ministries have gone through what I'm about to continue to share with you. So warning sign number two in these spiritually abusive Jezebel network organizations, there's always going to be someone that I call the pet Jezebel. It's a clear sign when you see somebody that I call the pet Jezebel operating freely in an organization. This person would constantly be around the leader, whether they're then in the office, on the phone with them, 
at their home or out to dinner, out socializing at events, the amount of time this individual spends with the leader is excessive and unhealthy. What happens is that individual is controlling through manipulation. They stay in power as a talented, charismatic person. I call them the pet because they're like a guard dog. The leadership tolerates their unruly behavior for their perceived benefit or protection, even though they're dangerous and unpredictable, much like if you had a guard dog. So a, a key trait of Jezebel is a desire to dominate all decision-making and ministry direction. They got to have, they got to be involved in all of it. They're a busy body. And the person makes themselves, they sell themselves. They sell a version of themselves, what they want people to think they are, which is very different from who they actually are. They make themselves appear highly valuable, indispensable. They do everything to seem outwardly helpful, but behind the scenes, they're controlling and manipulating the narrative, causing spiritual harm. They will rarely let, rarely let other people help. And if they do, they'll make it very difficult or uncomfortable. When others contribute, the Jezebel will discredit or downplay their efforts behind their back. Leaders will know it's a controlling spirit, but because of their own pride, they think that they can handle it or it's not as big of a deal as it is. You might even have conversations with them where they totally agree about the behavior being unacceptable and they indicate they'll take care of it, but they never do because they get sucked back in over and over. So when you're in this scenario, it often makes it look like one person, that Jezebel personality is the problem, but in reality, the whole organization has been infected and it starts with the head of the organization. Because the thing is, pastors and ministry leaders are overworked and they're underpaid. They're underappreciated and frankly, it's a thankless job and it's exhausting. There are some people that appreciate you, but for the most part, everyone takes you for granted. So then the, the um, you know, and that's just part of the understanding of being in ministry. You're doing it for God. You're not doing it for people. So what happens is then these exhausted leaders get faced with the temptation of having someone who is seemingly wonderful show up who's perfectly suitable to help take a large portion off their plate. And unfortunately, very many leaders bite the bait on this and welcome that Jezebel personality into their organization. The leader will overlook red flags and it'll allow the person to continue their abusive behavior because of their talents and abilities. They believe that the value they bring outweighs the harm that they're causing. Excuses will be made for the behavior, like they'll say, I know this isn't right when someone confronts them, but the Lord hasn't told me to fire or release them yet. What happens is this results in God's people, especially the weaker ones or the baby Christians being hurt, ignored, trampled upon, and there's no accountability for the individual that's causing the harm. So that makes the people being harmed think that God's ordaining it. In Proverbs 17, 13, it says, whoever rewards evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. So what that means is when evil is tolerated or allowed in a person's life or community, it takes root and then it becomes very difficult to remove because you're allowing sin or wickedness. So then it becomes strong and it's going to lead to ongoing issues because it's not being dealt with. When disobedience is tolerated, spiritual authority is lost. And this happens when a leader tolerates Jezebel thinking they can manage it because the Jezebel will be gaining more and more control and all the while the leaders find themselves being spiritually weakened and they get to a place where they're unable to take back dominion of their organization. Warning sign number three is control and manipulation. Leaders are key individuals in an organization that's spiritually abusive are going to use control and manipulation through fear to dominate others. This is a very toxic environment where uh, members are going to feel constant pressure or obligation to perform and sacrifice in, Lord, in order to truly be serving God. It creates anxiety and a sense of never being good enough. Members might feel like no matter how much they give or do, it's never enough. And there's this 
insinuation that if you don't oblige with, with every request to serve, you're falling short of God's expectations. This makes members second guess themselves, constantly feeling inadequate as if there's always one more thing they could have done differently. Leaders can be insatiable when they get that they call it like drunk with power. They offer little grace or appreciation for the sacrifices made. Any help that you've received from them is held over you with an you owe me attitude and it turns into a debt of endless servitude. And if you don't comply, then you're perceived as ungrateful. There's a tone also where prioritizing anything outside of ministry is equated with putting it before God. That cre creates unrealistic expectations and a sense of spiritual inadequacy. Serving the Lord should be done with freedom, not under fear and obligation. A healthy ministry understands that balance between household, children, and marriage, and it understands that those are all biblical priorities. It's not going to guilt its members into unhealthy priorities just to suit its own agenda. It's going to encourage you to take care of your home, take care of your marriage, take care of your children. Another form of spiritual manipulation is equating attendance with spirituality, suggesting that missing a church event means you're going to miss God. The Jezebel Network also demands conformity, equating that with godly submission, and labels any resistance as rebellion. It might try to control your relationships, dictate who members can associate with, or threaten divine punishment or curses if you want to leave that organization. Warning sign number four, you'll find the accuser of the brethren. Spiritually abusive organizations often operate through accusations, slander, overstepping boundaries, and trampling people's boundaries, really. Leaders or members tend to scrutinize or monitor and even criticize beyond what's appropriate. They're going to take private information and innocent conversations and later twist and use them as weapons for manipulation, which causes division. Jezebel personalities are very narcissistic and skilled at emotional manipulation. They love to play mind games and stir the pot of confusion for sport. These individuals often generate a network of followers. You might have heard them coined as the flying monkeys or eunuchs. What they do is they are used to gather information and carry out the Jezebel's dirty work. Jezebel will use these followers to spread accusation, gain ammunition, and further isolate and control the people in the organization. You see, the enemy frequently counterfeits and perverts the things of God. Exposing evil is biblical, but twisting the exposure of evil into baseless accusations is the accuser of the brethren. It's essential to be able to discern the difference between exposing evil and becoming an accuser of the brethren. The ultimate goal of the Jezebel is to dominate and control an organization. Just like in that story of Naboth's vineyard, Jezebel didn't need that vineyard. She sought it, and she even committed murder just to test the limits of what other people would tolerate. This mindset is what drives the actions of a Jezebel personality, constantly testing boundaries to see how much control they can get away with, how many people they can trample. Warning sign number five, you'll find sowing discord through undermining leadership behind their backs. In organizations where our Jezebel operates, so they're going to undermine and sidestep godly leadership. They often overstep their own authority. They claim that pastor said when he didn't, but most people don't question it because these people with this characteristics of a Jezebel, they lie so convincingly, they'll even swear to God over their own children without flinching. They do it effortlessly because they believe their own lies and their own delusions. See, the thing with Jezebel is it subtly sows discord and rebellion against those in charge because it thrives in division and creating internal conflict. What that's going to do is that's going to dilute the mission of the ministry or the church, and it's going to cause it to implode from within the confines of the leadership, the core leaders, right? The ones that are supposed to be pillars and holding it up are now being turned against each other because of the discord that's being sowed by the enemy. 
So what happens is they'll manipulate decisions and they try to control the direction of the ministry. And the reason why they're doing this is because those spirits hate the anointing and they hate anointed people. So their goal is to discredit them or even remove them by frustrating them and casting them into a bad light before the other people in the leadership. So instead of outright expressing dislike, what happens is Jezebels are more cunning than that. They'll publicly profess love. They'll even give gifts and shower compliments. The Bible calls that the great swelling words, right? But in private, they sow seeds of doubt, making their target appear to have poor character or un or ulterior motives. And then anybody who stands against the Jezebel, they're going to be isolated or shunned, often labeled as unteachable, even rebellious or dangerous to the organization. Warning sign number six, you'll find false teachings or prophecies. One of the clearest signs of a Jezebel is, is the promotion of false doctrines or prophecies, where truth is mixed with deception. The Jezebel will have supernatural dreams, very convenient visions, or a word from the Lord, which is actually sourced through divination. It might have partial truth, but the source is not from God, and it is not intended for the good of the flock. Ministries or leaders may claim that they have divine revelations which deviate from biblical truth. They use false prophecies to manipulate and control other people. This deception often justifies their abusive behavior as a necessary sacrifice for spiritual growth. They will use scripture to divine control over people, which is spiritual witchcraft and spiritually abusive. I'll give you an example. Maybe you're pointing something out that is not right or abusive about the uh, person with the Jezebel or something, and the leader will say something like, iron sharpens iron. God's going to use it for the good. Or this might be your cross to bear. Everyone has a thorn in their side. Something like that. So they twist God's word to mean something that it doesn't mean to give clearance for spiritual abuse. In environments where there's influence by Jezebel's network, the pulpit might be used to or misused to humiliate people instead of edifying them. Private information might be shared publicly in sermons, causing shame or embarrassment to the people that shared it in confidence. Communication in the body of Christ should be uplifting and constructing, not used as a tool to manipulate or harm other people. Ministers and preachers are called to be an example of love and humility, not to use their platform to dominate or humiliate other people. Any correction or guidance is welcome, but it should be done in love with the intent to build people up and help them receive healing and deliverance, not to tear them down publicly, which is going to cause more soul wounds. 1 Peter 5.2 says, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. Warning sign number seven, you might see hypocrisy. The head of the organization won't listen to you or ignores you. So even though the head knows you can go to the head and have conversations over and over, and even though they agree, they won't listen. And another way to spot this is when you are preparing to go to the head, you want to go to the head, you're getting yourself you know, set up to or make arrangements to speak with them, maybe make an appointment or something like that, you experience tremendous fear and mental torment about it because you know that there's going to be a price to pay, some retaliation. People in organizations who have this going on, they have a different set of rules for themselves than they do for the members of their organization. They might not be following their own counsel or their own teachings behind closed doors. I've seen this many times. They expect you to tolerate abuse and deal with situations which they would never tolerate or deal with if it was happening to them. 
Matthew 23, 1 says, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and they do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And then in Proverbs 25, 26, it says, Like a muddied fountain in a polluted spring is a righteous man who yields and compromises his, compromises his integrity before the wicked. So spiritual abuse occurs when righteous leaders or believers allow ungodly influences to persist in their organizations. Warning sign number eight. The ministry shifts from prioritizing helping people, which is what the foundation of the ministry was created upon, it shifts from that to now focusing on self-promotion and financial increase. So under the influence of a Jezebel, ministries often shift from prioritizing helping people to focusing on self-promotion and financial gain. Leaders in this environment seek recognition and status over serving Christ. They're going to use emotional manipulation to get others to comply with their personal ambitions and say that it's God that God said this, that they, they get like a God complex where they think that their personal ambitions are all the Holy Spirit's direction. So they'll surround themselves with an inner circle, which can be divisive, and you'll find a clickish atmosphere where it's clicky. You're either in the inner circle or you're not, and you want to be in, and you don't know why you want to be in because the people are not even sharing the attributes of God's love. But there's like this desire to want to fit in and be a part of that. But I've been in it. And trust me, it's not what you think it is. Don't desire to be in that. Desire to be with the Lord. You don't have to be in cliques or be part of the in uh, clique or the in elite circle. That's not of God. That's of the world. Amen. So how this happens is... If, you know, there's a lot of financial struggle when you're, um, when you have a church or a ministry, there's a lot of financial burden and overwhelm and that financial struggle can be a gateway. It can become a gateway for leaders to agree to tolerate the influence of a Jezebel network, justifying the harmful behaviors to secure funding because Jezebel has talents and abilities and they promise to increase the reach of the organization and they promise to increase the finances. That's how they market themselves to attach to the organization. So, you know, money is necessary in life. Money is necessary for ministry, but when it becomes the primary focus, it leads to compromise. So scripture warns us that the love of money is the root of all evil. And when, when financial gain takes precedence, then it opens the door for destructive influences to take root in a ministry. It doesn't mean we don't have to do what is required to gain income, but we can't prioritize the income over trusting God because that is an open door for evil, right? Evil to take root. So something you might, a, a sign of this happening in an organization is you might, you might be, threatened with financial curses or told that you don't trust God if you don't give an unreasonable amount of time and money to that organization. Warning sign number nine is you're going to find strong resistance in the leadership for acknowledging any error going on. They're, they're not even going to be available to discuss it with you probably. There's often a strong resistance to accountability and repentance in spiritually abusive leadership. The leaders refuse to admit when they're wrong, they avoid repentance, and they reject any efforts at re reconciliation. So when a, a member comes to them and voices concerns or points out grievances, which is biblical, or if that member decides to leave, they're often shunned, labeled as disloyal, or there's an unspoken rule created that nobody should associate with them anymore because they're a wolf in sheep's clothing or they bit the bait or something like that. They're a danger now. So one of the most harmful traits of this type of leadership is their resistance to correction. They don't have accountability. So while they're very quick to correct others, they deflect blame when they're confronted. 
they turn the situation against the one raising the concerns. That is all narcissistic and abusive and gaslighting tactics, right? So instead of resolving conflicts or accepting valid criticism, they manipulate and bully those who challenge them. So that creates a culture where only those who flatter or fear the leadership are welcomed and authenticity is stifled. You can't be genuine because they don't want you to be genuine. They want you to bow. Another attribute of that situation is leaders may hold secret meetings or send formal written reprimands through text or email to those who speak out against them, offering no chance for an open discussion. Meetings will be one-sided where decisions are announced without any room for dialogue or mutual understanding. You'll be labeled as rebellious if you don't conform. That's a very toxic environment. It leads Room, it leaves room for very little growth or correction. We all need to be corrected at times. And we should all be okay with being corrected. We should all be okay with being willing to look in the mirror. Especially if you're putting yourself in a position as a leader in the body of Christ. Because we're supposed to be leading other people to be willing to look in the mirror by us exemplifying that behavior in our own life. Right? Humility in our own life. That's how you teach people humility, by walking in humility. And I'm now getting to warning sign number 10, and then we're going to be done here, is in a spiritually abusive Jezebel culture church, you're going to find drama, lots and lots of drama and division. In a ministry influenced by a Jezebel network, drama and tension are constant. Leaders are going to spend a lot of time focusing on... Um, Leaders will spend a lot of time focusing on personal conflicts and power struggles, making a big deal about their own victories, but ignoring the failures. And at the same time, these Jezebel personalities will downplay other successes or their victories and exaggerate and blow their mistakes out of proportion. So instead of addressing or spending the appropriate amount of time focusing on real concerns, they spend a lot of time managing all the drama and discord and chaos and division that has been being created by allowing Jezebel personality to take up residence in their organization. So what's going to happen is leaders are going to often prioritize wrong things. Instead of focusing on spiritual growth, truth, or God's guidance, they get caught up in personal conflict, pride, entertainment, control, money, their decisions seem to be driven by what benefits them in the moment, not what honors God or protects the flock. And it reminds me of King Herod, right? He was entertained by Herodias' daughter. He was entertained by his own stepdaughter dancing. I'm pretty sure it was a seductive type of dancing entertainment. So leaders can make dangerous decisions when they prioritize entertainment or personal pleasure over righteousness. Herod's focus on pleasing his guests and indulging in ungodly entertainment made him, led him into making a terrible promise that resulted in the violent beheading of John the Baptist, one of God's most highly anointed servants. This shows how allowing the wrong influences to take center stage can lead to catastrophic harm, even harming those who God has called and anointed. Leaders who tolerate harmful actions to retain a person's talents and abilities are allowing abuse to persist. And this is going to result in manipulation, division, and long-term spiritual damage because the leadership is failing to protect the congregation from toxic influences. Leaders are responsible to care for God's people with a willing heart, setting an example of service and humility rather than using their position for control or selfish gain. And as uh, Thyatira was told, God allowed time for repentance, but when repentance is refused, judgment follows. So if you get to a place where you have had conversations with ministry leaders or church leaders and they refuse to address the, the issue, it's now going to be up to you to remove yourself from that situation. Each person must individually discern with the Lord what this looks like for them. Because remember, God does not send us to endure spiritual abuse. 
He's not going to send you to an organization to endure spiritual abuse. Abusive people have taught you that. Okay? This is not God teaching you a lesson. This is people misusing their authority. And while, yes, all things do work to the good, meaning we can learn from every experience and grow from it, and adversity does help produce character, it doesn't mean that that's God's best for us and that he's ordaining us to suffer in situations at the hands of spiritual abusers. Leaders are entrusted with caring for God's people. So if they do choose to remove that Jezebel's influence, which is a very rare thing, they need to then focus on healing the congregation and restoring a healthy spiritual environment. And some organizations do recover from this, most do not, which is why the scenario was addressed in one of the seven letters to the church in Revelation. It's an important issue, it's a prevalent issue, and it is an issue that God felt the need to address and rebuke Harkley. So if you've had to leave an organization, make sure that you take the time to heal with the Lord and let him deal with your heart. Acknowledge your wounds, break the soul ties, and allow God to bring restoration. Don't try to ignore the damage or try to tough it out because the spiritual aftermath is going to follow you. If you don't address it properly and chase that stuff out of your life, it's going to follow you. So as we close, I want to make sure you understand that it's essential to remember that spiritual abuse is not something to be tolerated, nor is it a burden that you are meant to carry. We're called to discern the truth and stand firm in the freedom that Christ died for us. He died to provide us freedom, not torment. And the enemy works subtly, often through manipulation and control, but with biblical wisdom and the Holy Spirit's guidance, you can identify and avoid these toxic influences. So if you found yourself entangled in a ministry that reflects on anything that we've discussed, know that God sees your pain and wants you to walk in peace, not in confusion or bondage. So be, be vigilant and prayerful, and don't be afraid to stand up for righteousness and step away from unhealthy environments in order to protect your spiritual health and well-being. In 2 Timothy 3.1, and I'm almost done here, it says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, lovers of lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying, it, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Tonight I've shared a lot of insights that are going to help you to recognize spiritual abuse. But more importantly, I want you to know that when you stand against these situations, the Lord will sustain and protect you. And he's proud of you when you face fear and you do the right thing in the face of adversity. So let's stop submitting to fear and intimidation and start standing against it so we can walk in the true freedom that Christ died to give us. Thank you for being a part of this critical conversation. If it's blessed you, please share it with a friend in need. And if you have enjoyed our content, please hit like, share, and subscribe, and invite your friends to be a part of Mountain Movers. Take care for now. Bye.